Thanks, everybody, for coming uh, on the last day, on the afternoon. Thanks for your attention. So uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm David Lang uh, from, from Pivotal. I'm an engineering lead. And, and I'm Jim Thompson. I'm product lead at Pivotal as well. Uh, Pivotal produces a platform as a service product called Cloud Foundry, which you may have heard of. Uh, it's not that relevant. But our background is that we work with our customers and our de development teams trying to I guess, influence the systems that keeps everybody upgraded and patches. Uh, so what we want to talk about today is how we can use the uh, error budget model that I hope that many of us know and love uh, to manage some other things. So to level set, uh, our expectation is that you've uh, read this book, uh, the Site Reliability Engineering book, and that you've had a similar experience to the one we've had within Pivotal um, is that using error budgets brings uh, sort of sanity to the process of managing availability. So just to level set um, some common terms, I'm sure you've all heard of these before. Uh, so when we are thinking about availability, we typically have, um, we sort of plot uh, on, a, on, a, on a graph something against time. Uh, and that thing is what we call our service level indicator. So it's some measurement of the value that our system is delivering. And so in this particular case, uh, we're measuring how much downtime uh, we've had in our system and computing the sort of rolling downtime over a period of time, say 30 days. So that's our service level indicator. And then we have some kind of service level objective. So that's a threshold below which we're trying to keep the service level indicator. So in this example, if we were shooting for uh, three nines of availability, uh, we might be trying to keep our 30-day rolling count of downtime to below 43 minutes uh, every 30 days. And finally, we have some kind of policy. So that is an agreed-upon action that we'll take when our service level indicator approaches our uh, service level objective. So when our measure approaches the threshold, so in this case, when we start burning some error budget and we're approaching that three nines availability SLO, we may change focus from releasing features to focusing on availability. So when we talk about the error budget mechanics, what we're talking about is this hopefully familiar um, process of measuring user value, having some threshold, and having a policy to take some action when you get close to that threshold. And our hope is that um, using this has been a life-changing experience for you as it has been for us. And that's it. Thank you. Wait, 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 wait. David, 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 David. That was really short, eh? Okay. And I think you missed a couple things. Okay. Um, I can think of other things that we might care about as SREs, right? Um, if your system is available, that's great. But is your system also secure? Should you care about that? Hit me. Okay, sure. So we have this graphic here, and this is an SRE sitting pretty in his house. Uh, uptime is great, and this SRE doesn't realize that his house is literally on fire with security issues. Okay, Jim, what's your point? Okay, well, I have, let me make my point a little <laughs> bit stronger. I have a quote that I love. Uh, uptime isn't success if you're infected. So that should be pretty clear, okay, right? I'll, okay, I'll okay. give you that. So, okay, my point is that availability is important and security is also important. Okay, I agree. Cool. Now we're done. Uh, we're not done yet. Though. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, in addition to being secure and available, yeah, yeah. don't you think your customers want to be running the latest and greatest things and getting a lot of value out of your system? Uh, come well, let me make an argument for you. So right. here, we have uh, an example uh, of a horse and carriage, and this thing works, right? It can get you from point A to point B just fine. Uh, and you have a well-fed horse. You have a full-time driver. Yep. And uh, these wheels are greased. And you own this carriage. And you can go anywhere you want as long as it's close by uh, any time you want. So it's really reliable. Um, it's relatively safe. I actually have no idea how safe horse and carriages are, but we'll say it's safe enough. But I'm guessing I can't charge my iPhone, right? Uh, I don't think they come with a USB charger. Okay. Right? But you know what does? This fine automobile, this is a new Lexus, uh, which is uh, known to be a very reliable automobile. Mm -hmm. It has all the new safety features. It's pretty secure. 
Uh, but you know what? It does have a USB charger and a lot of other things we've come up with in car technology over the last 100 years or so. And this is what your customers really want. Okay, I think you're about to make a point. Yeah, I, I guess I will make a point. So availability is important. Security is also important. And feature freshness is also very important. All right. Okay, Jim. So I think what we've said is that in operating a system, there are multiple important domains. We've picked on three. And it turns out that we have a, um, a model for regulating one of those availability that works really well. And this is the error budget model. We know that it works really well for dealing with availability. And the question we're asking is, can we use similar mechanics to think about security and about feature freshness? So let's start with security. What if, in addition to an error budget, we had a vulnerability budget, right? So same kind of graphs, we're measuring something, an SLI uh, over time, and we have some kind of threshold. So what happens if we said, our SLI is the number of days since the dependency that we're running was patched and released, all right? So as by way of example, let's say that uh, we're running on top of the JVM, and the JVM version that we're running, its patch version, uh, was released 26 days ago. So that means that that software has been available to the world, including the bad actors, to hunt for CVEs for at least 26 days. So the longer that uh, this, or the, the more time that this uh, software, the higher this SLI is, the greater the chance that there is some CVEs being found within it. So if we're doing that, then our SLO in this system might be some max age, some threshold in days, below which we think if we're above that, then we're taking on too much risk in being vulnerable. But if we keep ourselves below that, uh, then that might keep us secure enough. And so arbitrarily, I've said here 30 days. And then we'd want some kind of policy. So the policy would be when our measure, the age of our patch, uh, gets close to our threshold, then we want to take some action. And that action may be apply security patches. There we go, so same model as we use for uh, availability, but just applied with slightly different calculations, where our SLI is number of days since the dependency patch that we're using has, was released, our SLO is what's the maximum age that we're comfortable with, and our policy is when we approach that maximum age, do security patching. Now the question I have is, is 30 days reasonable? I just arbitrarily picked 30, but is that a good number? Well, David, I have a story for you. All right. Uh, this is a purely hypothetical story. Okay. Uh, the names have been changed to protect the guilty. All right. Uh, it is a, say there's a large U.S. company. Okay. And this company collects a lot of personal and financial information, mm -hmm. like a whole lot. They'd be careful with that, wouldn't they? They would be Very careful, careful yes. yeah. And uh, they do this from, they collect this information from almost everyone, at mm -hmm. least the folks who live in the United States. Mm hmm and they do that for anyone, even if they've signed up for this company's service or not. Well, that's they customer just, service I know, for it's you, great. right there, right there, yeah. Let's call this company uh, Equifax. Mm -hmm. Good name, good name. Okay, so Equifax in 2017 yep. had a really big event, right? Uh, and it's pretty infamous. 143 million people were affected. Hi hi hypothetical people. Uh, hypothetical yeah, people, yeah. yeah. And hypothetically, I was affected. Yep, uh, yep. How about you, were you? Uh, no, no, no. I, I lost my data in a breach to a big, well-known hotel chain. Okay, cool. Um, so, so this breach uh, affected a lot of people, mm -hmm. and it affected really personal and really valuable and personal data. For mm -hmm. them. Uh, and this led to firings and resignations. It led to an FBI investigation. It led to congressional hearings. This is a really bad thing. So, pretty infamous. Not a good day to own their stock either. Uh, Hypothetically. No. no. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also pretty avoidable. Right? Ah. Um, so th this breach was caused by a known issue in Apache Struts. Okay. So I'm going to share uh, with everyone a timeline. Uh, and this timeline runs from uh, May of 2016 to July uh, of 2017, from the time that uh, Struts 2.5 was released to the time that Equifax discovered that, their, that they had been hacked. Right? Mm -hmm. And I want to zoom in on a couple key dates here. The first one is March 7th. This is the date that the Apache Struts team published their CVE. Uh, the day before, they had made a patch available. 
uh, to uh, fix that vulnerability. That's pretty and normal procedure, right? Pretty normal procedure. Yeah. And so as of March 7th, everyone uh, who was paying attention uh, was aware of this vulnerability. Including the bad actors. Including the bad actors and including Equifax. As oh, interesting. Out. And so we know a little bit uh, about uh, March 7th. Mm -hmm. um, they realized that this vulnerability existed. They even realized that they were probably affected by it. And they communicated out internally to uh, everyone who might be able to act on it and said, we believe we might be affected. If you uh, need to patch this uh, vulnerability, please do so in 48 hours. OK. Yeah. But it didn't happen in 48 hours for any number of reasons. And we actually don't know exactly when they eventually uh, uh, applied the patch. But we know it was after May 13th. Because on May 13th, the hackers were successful in breaching Equifax's system. Hmm. Um, and the time that elapsed between March 7th and May 13th is 67 days. Uh, and therefore, the hack was successful. They didn't realize they'd been hacked for a number of other months until the end of July. Uh, and everyone's information was stolen. Not everyone, 143 million people. I feel like I know where you're going here. Well, let's just say that Equifax had an SLO and mm -hmm. their vulnerab had a vulnerability budget, and they had an SLO of 30 days. We'd be telling a different story. Actually, we wouldn't even be telling this story at all. Uh, but uh, they, would have they would have received uh, a patch on March 6th. They would have gotten information about that patch on March 7th. Um, and no matter what, within 30 days, they would have applied that patch. So at the very latest, they would have applied it by April 7th, which is still a full month before the hackers were, su were successful. Okay. And all of our data would be safe. Okay. So in this case, a 30 days SLO would have worked for Equifax. That's good. So there's a hypothetical example. What, what might this look like in, in real world? Does that mean you patch every 30 days? Well, it depends on your context. But okay. we happen to have a real life example from Pivotal Software. Mm -hmm. So here we have uh, an, SRE, an SRE team at Pivotal who is running a platform for a large SaaS tenant. Yep. And they've been experimenting with this idea for the last six months. And in this example, we're going to share how, how they're thinking about patching the Ubuntu operating system right. for their Cloud Foundry Foundation, as we call it. And when they patch this Ubuntu uh, operating system, it really means that they're rebuilding and repaving their whole system. It's right. a pretty big deal. It makes it, the platform makes it pretty easy, but it's a pretty... Uh, so you can uh, sort of think thing. of it as like rebuilding your base layer or... Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and they have also chosen a max age threshold of uh, 30 days for oh, their SLO. Conveniently. And this is what it looks like. So we have a number of peaks and troughs here. Uh, and along the x-axis, uh, we increment along days uh, in the calendar. And on the y-axis, we count the number of days since we have patched Ubuntu in our system. Uh, and as you might expect, as the days on the calendar go by, the red lines get higher and higher mm -hmm. uh, for patch age or release age. And when they run, this when they run a patch, uh, it falls off a cliff, and they start again, right? Um, the gray line is their 30 days target. That is their SLO. Yep. Uh, and they've seen a few things be very uh, successful. How are they able to stay under this threshold? First, that they, first is that they run on a regular cadence. In, the, in fact, this team just chooses a day of the week where they're patching their operating system. OK. Um, and so like patch Tuesdays. Pa yes, Tuesdays. We'll, we'll call it Tuesdays for this one. Mm -hmm. um, they don't hit it every Tuesday. Sometimes there isn't a patch available, of course. Uh, sometimes they, for some reason or another, can't uh, run, do the upgrade mm -hmm. on that day. Maybe their availability budget uh, is depleted or something. They decide not to. Yep. Yep. Um, but for the most part, having a regular cadence that they stick to means that you know, many times they reach a patch age, uh, release age of about 20 days, uh, sometimes less, and sometimes more. Uh, and that's plenty. Uh, that's plenty below their threshold. And so that also means that uh, when times such as the middle of this graph, uh, which happen to, which coincides with holidays, they might go longer without being able to patch, but they're mm -hmm. still able to remain under that threshold. That's interesting. So there's a, a couple more things we want to say about this. So first of all, this has been really motivating for the team. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's also been really valuable for them to be able to broadcast the value they've delivered. Yeah. So oftentimes, when you talk about security, you're trying to prevent something that hopefully won't happen 
in the future. So it's hard to brag about things that don't happen. Uh, but this Congratulations is a way. Congratulations for not being hacked. Exactly. Said no one yeah. ever. Exactly. Yeah. And so. This is a way that you can broadcast, uh, that this team can broadcast to mm -hmm. their stakeholders and to themselves about the value that they're bringing to the security of their platform. That's really interesting. All right, so um, hopefully we've convinced you that here's at least one way which we can use the same mechanics uh, that we use for availability to monitor something else that's, that's, that's of value in, a, uh, in, in operating a platform, security. What about the feature freshness? What about that Lexus that uh, Jim so keen on. So let's imagine that we had something called a legacy budget, right? And a legacy budget sort of helps us choose which version of a dependency do we want to be running, which feature version. So for the purpose of this um, example, I'm going to be talking about Kubernetes. And the question that we're putting to ourselves is, which Kubernetes version should we be running? Uh, Kubernetes 1.14 was released on Monday. How soon until we, uh, until we upgrade to that? Now, a couple of things that you should uh, just know about the Kubernetes release lifecycle. So approximately every 90 days, they release a new feature version, um, and they support two previous feature versions. So at any point in time, the three most recent feature versions are receiving security patches, and the, the, the one that is um, what they would call N-3 or four versions ago no longer receives security patches. Uh, so if you're running Kubernetes 1.11 at the moment, you may be in a situation where you're about to stop receiving security patches. And again, we have exactly the same um, sort of setup. We have uh, time along the x-axis, uh, our measure on the y-axis, and then we're plotting where we are uh, at points in time. So let's say that our, um, our SLI in, in the legacy budget model would be the number of days since the feature was released. So this point on the graph over here, if we were running Kubernetes version 111 dot something, then it would be, say, 143 days since that version had been released. The SLO in this case is a little bit more interesting uh, because not only do we have an upper bound, it's almost certain that we want to be running something that's still receiving security patches. So that's the top of our bound. But we probably also don't want to be running something that's too new. Maybe it has features that are not quite stable enough yet. Uh, so we probably have a lower bound as well. And so our SLO becomes less of a line and more of a range that we're trying to stay within. And then finally, we would have a policy, which is probably related to how frequently the releases are made. In the case of um, Kubernetes, you probably want to be upgrading uh, every 90 days. So in this particular example, we were running version 1.12. Uh, it was uh, about 90 days after the release of version 1.14, uh, and so that triggered us to do an upgrade so that we'd stay within that Goldilocks range. Okay, so we'll just recap. Um, we have our budget model, which we know and we love uh, for availability, mm -hmm. and we use error budgets there. When we're looking at security, uh, we can use something called the vulnerability budget. And for feature freshness, we can use something we call the legacy budget. And again, the model is exactly the same for each. So in each case, we have a service level indicator, and this is a measurement of the user value that you're delivering. You have a service level objective, which is the threshold that makes sense in your context for the thing you're talking about. And you have a policy to ensure that you stay under that threshold. And that's the end for real this time. Um, we're happy to answer questions at the side of the stage after. And we've also opened a thread on Slack if you want to join the conversation there.